Hi, my name is Yasmin Tarehi, and this is Gateways to Awakening, where we host one-on-one conversations with leading experts in wellness and spirituality. On today's episode, I'll be featuring Brenda Dunn, who was the laboratory manager of the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research, known as Peer Laboratory, from its inception in 1979 until its closing in 2007. She now serves as the president and treasurer of ICRL, the International Consciousness Research Laboratories. And I'm just so excited to welcome her to the show. And uh, welcome to the show, Brenda. Thank you, Yasmin. I'm glad to be here. (laughs) <laughs> likewise, likewise. There's been quite a few people, past guests, who recommended your name and your work. And so I'm really excited to talk to you. So to kick it off, uh, before we get into some of your work, I'm curious to hear about what your experience has been and also your observations of how intuition works. The intuition is something we all have And it's uh, sort of accessing information from the heart, if you will, rather than from the head. So when we kind of just allow our inner self, our spiritual side uh, to communicate with us, we usually get some very valuable information. And I I think that's what intuition is, is just learning how to listen to that inner voice. Great. And, you know, before we also move on to some of the other concepts of your work, uh, maybe you could tell the audience what PEER is, why it was created, and your role in the program, because it was it, it was around for quite a while. So I'm just super interested to hear why it, why it was started, why it was created, and your role. Okay. Uh, back in around 1978, uh, Robert John, or Bob, Uh, was serving as dean of the Princeton University School of Engineering. And one day a student approached him and asked if he would supervise an independent project that she wanted to conduct that was essentially an attempt to replicate some of the findings that were reported by physicist um, Helmut Schmidt where he had uh, created a random number generator, and then he would ask people to interact with this device and try to get it to behave in a given a given direction. Uh, now, this was something that Bob really had no knowledge of or any particular interest in at the time, uh, but he felt that a uh, the the construction and testing of a random number generator was an appropriate project for an engineering student. And he agreed to uh, to supervise it. And for the next year or so, the student carried out this experiment. She built a small random number generator, an electronic device that functioned sort of like an electronic coin flipper. It generated bits ones and zeros in a completely random order, you know, one, one, zero, one, zero, zero, et cetera, and would ask people to try to get the the, uh, counts of the ones or zeros to go higher or lower. And by the end of the project, she had uh, demonstrated some very interesting and statistically significant results And um, at that point, she kind of lost interest in it, but Bob had uh, become really intrigued by the implications of this work, in particular for the the possibility that human consciousness could affect random electronic uh, processes. So he went about trying to set up a small program uh, in the engineering school to study this, Um, He ran into a bit of uh, resistance from the university's administration, uh, which felt that this was not really an appropriate scientific project. But uh, Bob, uh, he had tenure. (laughs) He was uh, an administrative officer of the university, and uh, he was able to uh, produce the funding needed for uh, setting up this program. Uh, His main area of research had been aerospace engineering, in particular, advanced electric propulsion systems 
for space travel. And in that context, he uh, was familiar with many people in the aerospace uh, family or domain, including Mr. James McDonnell, who was the patriarch of the McDonnell Aircraft Company. And uh, he spoke to Mr. McDonnell or Mr. Mack, as he was known, about this project. And Mr. Mack said, you know, I think this is an important topic to study. From time to time, we get reports of these so-called gremlin effects where cockpit controls malfunction in very peculiar, inexplicable ways, particularly when the pilots are under some form of emotional stress. And um, I think that uh, we need to set up this program at Princeton. Mr. Mack was a Princeton alumni, alumnus himself. And if you set the program up, I'll fund it. And so off he went. Um, within the next year, after much discussion with the school's administration, they finally agreed to uh, let him set the program up with certain caveats. Uh, he, was not, he could not engage uh, graduate students or uh, even to study uh, human behavior per se. Uh, but Bob explained that the subject of his study would be uh, the electronic or random de uh, physical devices. So they finally agreed. And then Bob went off to try to find uh, somebody who could help him uh, with the program on the day-to-day -day basis. He, of course, was do running his electric propulsion research. He was uh, managing the engineering school. And he really didn't have the time to devote to doing this full time. Well, at about the same time that this student was doing her project, I had returned to a school to finish my college degree, which I had stopped early, uh, earlier to get married and have a family. But now I went back to school and I was studying. Uh, I had two majors, basically, one in psychology and one in humanities. And in the psychology uh, department, well, in both departments, I had to do uh, an independent project myself. In the humanities uh, area, I did a study and wrote a paper on altered states of consciousness. And in the psychology area, I did some of the earliest replications of the remote viewing work that had been reported by two physicists at uh, SRI, Stanford Research Institute. Now, remote perception is a process whereby one individual would try to describe the geographical location where another individual would be situated at a given time without any uh, recourse to any kind of sensory input. And I thought this was rather intriguing in particular because in their paper, they mentioned that sometimes the person, the percipient, the person who was attempting to describe the scene uh, would get information about the scene before the scene was even selected. Uh, and that intrigued me a great deal. What were some of the studies that came out of that? Like, are there any, you, you talked about it being statistically significant. Um, is there a broad strokes kind of general uh, you know, statistics that came out that you can share with with the audience? Because I'm just super intrigued, like the studies on, on uh, remote viewing and then also how consciousness can affect things like electrical devices. Like that's just fascinating. So yeah, I'm just curious if you have anything to share. About those things. Well, I went to a meeting of the Parapsychological Association. This was in the summer of uh, 78 um, to give a talk about some of the remote viewing studies that I had done, uh, in particular, some that were extremely long distance uh, separations. They were uh, between the Midwest in the US and in Eastern Europe. And some of these were actually obtained or described up to 24 hours before the, um, the uh, agent or the person who was sending or visiting the site uh, had actually been there. 
the way we did the statistical analysis at that time was to have a human judge uh, attempt to match the percipient's description with an assortment of pictures and try to um, match the uh, the description with the correct picture. And uh, it turned out that more often than not, uh, they were able to do this. So in any event, uh, I gave a talk about this uh, experiment uh, at this meeting and it, that where Bob was attending. And at this time, Bob was looking around for somebody who he could work with uh, at this new laboratory he was establishing. And um, we met during a coffee break. He asked me uh, what I was going to do next. And I said, well, I have some issues with the judging procedure. I think we need to develop a more incisive and quantitative method for evaluating the information it acquired in this process. And then he made some suggestions. I mean, this was really quite, quite a wonderful conversation. He suggested that we might consider uh, developing a set of descriptor questions that they both the agent and the percipient could answer, such as, is the scene indoors or outdoors? Is it drab or colorful? Are there people present, et cetera, et cetera? Well, in any event, he then told me that he was planning to set up this program at Princeton and asked if I would be interested in working with him on it. And uh, <laughs> my response was, you bet. Um, it turned out that the circumstances of my life had recently changed. I had gotten divorced. I had sold my house and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life. At that time, I was working on my um, graduate studies at the University of Chicago. Um, but I had completed most of the courses I had to take, and I just needed to, to write a thesis. Anyway, one thing led to another. He went back to the university and suggested that he'd like to hire me. They weren't quite sure why a psychologist would be an appropriate manager for an engineering program. But uh, Bob uh, convinced them that this was the right person. And in June of 1979, uh, I moved from the Chicago area with my two children, my dog and two cats, uh, to Princeton. And we, uh, we started the PEAR uh, program. Of course, it didn't have a name at the time. It was really just a small uh, area in the basement of the engineering school next to the machine shop. In June of 1979, we set up the laboratory in a basement area uh, next to the machine shop. And the program really had two main areas of study. One was the uh, continuing the work that the student had done with an electronic random number generator. And the second part was trying to develop analytical techniques for remote viewing. Um, so th this was the basic uh, point of the program. Although it started out as a, an engineering focus, it we became very clear after a while, and we started seeing positive results coming out of both of these domains, that we were looking at something that was far, far more profound than simple, um, you know, engineering strategies. People were able, ordinary people, people who didn't claim to have any unusual abilities, would volunteer to do experiments in the program. And uh, we encouraged them to repeat the experiments and come back and generate a lot of data. And uh, as the years went by, we found statistically significant results in both of these uh, uh, empirical programs, uh, we had a, a number of different random physical devices in addition to the electronic coin flipper, if you will, or REG. We also had a big macroscopic pinball machine, a random mechanical cascade that dropped 9,000 balls through a maze of pegs into collecting bins and people would try to get the balls to go to the right or to the left. And there were a number of other programs or experiments that we explored over the years. But in all of them, uh, we were finding positive effects 
positive correlations between the operator's intentions, which were recorded ahead of time, and the output of the devices. The effects tended to be quite small, and it was uh, you, you wouldn't really see that it was anything unusual uh, until you accumulated in lots and lots of trials. For an example, if you flip a coin 10 times, you would expect by chance to get five heads, but you might get six or you might get four, and you wouldn't be terribly upset about that. But if you flip that coin 100 times and you got 60 heads, or you flipped it a thousand times and got 600 heads, now that small effect was compounding to a very unlikely uh, uh, cumulative deviation from chance. And this is what we saw across all of our experiments. We also developed a variety of techniques to quantify the remote viewing. We did, oh, 750 or so exper or remote viewing experiments, mainly to test these algorithms. But there too, we were finding that people were acquiring far more information than they should by chance. And, and as I started to say, although our main variable was intention, many of our participants would say, you know, there's a lot more than just intention. I have to have an emotional connection with the device I'm working with, sort of like somebody might have with a, a musician with their instrument or a, a techie per person with their computer. But they would describe the experience as if somehow or other the, ex the experiment, the, I'm sorry, the operator and the device had become one unified system. And so uh, there we were, we found that, okay, intention was only part of the problem, uh, part, I'm sorry, part of the process, uh, but there was also an important variable that we called resonance. Okay. What is that? Uh, resonance is, uh, <laughs> it's a, a word that is uh, acceptable in science. It's actually a fancy scientific word that uh, means love. Okay. <laughs> it's when uh, two systems or people are, if you will, on the same wavelength, when they are sharing uh, an experience uh, in a way that it, it makes it unique to the two of them. We would call that resonance. And to test this resonance idea, what we did was we, we, we uh, developed these small portable random event generators that were attached to these little palm top computers. And they were taken into different environments, uh, particularly environments where there would be a strong resonance among the people uh, in the, uh, the, the, um, the process. It might be a musical event, it might be a, a religious gathering, it might be a meditation group. Uh, and we also took it out to what we would call mundane situations, a lecture, a business meeting, and so forth. And what we discovered was once again, when there was a strong resonance in the group, that is when everybody was sort of experiencing this event in a shared way, um, the REG would produce excursions from chance uh, that were not expected by, uh, you know, just a, a pure a random process. And when we took it to the mundane environments, the devices put out strictly random output. Somehow or other, these devices were picking up on this group resonance, uh, if you will, uh, and sharing in it. And the people at these meetings or concerts or whatever um, had no idea that there was an REG running. That was, you know, in the background, it just ran continuously. But at the times when something wonderful was happening and there was this deep connection that people were experiencing, the REG seemed to be experiencing as well. It, as well. So anyway, that was the, the basic uh, part of the empirical PEAR program. Um, I don't know if you mentioned it, but PEAR stood for Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research. So 
Uh, Brenda, um, I wanted to also uh, switch gears and talk a little bit about some of the the books that you've written. Um, but I'm I'm curious. So, like, after you found that intention and resonance made a major impact, or not a major impact? I guess it made an impact <laughs> um, on what the operator was observing. Uh, can you maybe give a specific example on like what, what shifted, like what were they, what was actually shifting? And then also have companies or the government um, or other, uh, I guess, organizations taken this work or taken some of these studies and adapted it into their own way of viewing the world? Um, so that's two separate questions. And then another question that I had is, does it have to be love? Is it any strong emotion or does it have to be something like love? Well, uh, let me start with that one. It seems to be uh, stronger when uh, there is an emotional affection. For example, we did some experiments we called co-operator experiments, where two people would attend to the REG with the same intention uh, at the same time. And um, as it happened, the results were quite unexpected. We found that when uh, the two operators, the co-operators, were both the same sex. Uh, the results were pretty close to chance, but when they were of opposite sex, they were producing results that were uh, more than twice as large as either of them would generate on their own. And to make it even more amazing, if they turned out to be a what we call a bonded couple, uh, that is that the two people were in love or had a deep relationship, the results they produced were about seven times larger than their individual results. Wow. So so you're saying if it's a couple of the opposite, so it, there's something to do with it being the opposite sex. And if they're a couple that's very bonded, then it's seven times, there's a seven time higher capacity to change, I guess, or I, I, not change, I guess the, the maybe it's like was stronger. the effect was stronger. Wow. That is. They asked, you know, have we looked at gay couples? We never did because we really could not test people um, per se. Um, and, you know, the university was very funny about such things. So, uh, but I would imagine that uh, it, the same thing would apply to a gay couple that was in love as, as a, a heterosexual cu couple did. Wow. Yeah. This is like mind blowing. <laughs> so maybe, you know, people should sit with their beloveds and, um, and start manifesting <laughs> things. Well, it, basically love seems to uh, make the world run more smoothly. I think most of us intuitively know that. Um, we then looked at gender uh, we wanted to see if women and men individually got different results. And that, too, was kind of a surprise. We found that male operators tended to get effects that were in the direction of their intention, but the effects were very tiny. And uh, the female operators would get bigger effects, but they were not necessarily in the direction of intention. Um, th this was, you know, this led to a study where we looked at uh, gender studies across different fields. And um, I decided that what we had just discovered was the secret to why men don't ask directions. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> it, it seems that males are better than females at uh, um, spatial orientation. Uh, females are better than males at communication and uh, building a uh, community. And um, when, but when they were working together, the male intention with the female amplitude seemed to produce these larger effects. Uh, now, let me go back. You asked a number of questions before that. Uh, all of the work at PAIR was fi financed by uh, individual uh, uh, sponsors like Mr. McDonnell, uh, Lawrence Rockefeller was one of our sponsors, John Fetzer, uh, Donald Webster. Many of these were uh, Princeton alumni. And of course, the Princeton <laughs> University was not terribly happy that we were getting money from these people that should be going to the university. But uh, 
the, the gifts were not monumental. They were not millions of dollars, but they were enough to keep us going. We had a staff uh, typically of about five people who all came from different backgrounds, psychology, engineering, physics, uh, statistics, and so forth. And it was a great team uh, that worked together wonderfully. Uh, and I think that also was um, part of the resonance. We, we got along most of the time. Uh, very well. And when a new project came along or a problem to be solved, uh, everybody pitched in with their gifts and talents and things got resolved uh, very quickly. Um, we never received money from the government or from any corporations. It was all just individual gifts uh, from the beginning of the program until it was time to close it. Um, and then you would also ask whether other people had uh, done experiments. I think, I think our work did stimulate a lot of other researchers to look at experiments involving random event generators. It seemed that uh, this was something where you know you could quantify or measure the effects fairly well and apply basic statistics to it, and. Um, there are still other programs that are going on. Uh, oh, the Institute of Noetic Sciences uh, has a program using random event generators and many, many other groups. Uh, they, they ask different questions of it, but uh, it turns out to be a very useful tool for this kind of study. Yeah, we we actually interviewed uh, someone who is the, the director of research, Helena Wahbi, on this show, who's at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. And um, they definitely have a lot of these studies and also, also shared a lot of the kind of similar um, conclusions on intention. Um, we didn't really get into gender and the resonance piece as much, but uh, yeah, it's super fascinating. And Brenda, I would like to actually switch gears because I have so many questions and I really want to hear more from you. I think you have such a wealth of knowledge and I think so many people are going to be so intrigued to learn more. Um, you wrote a book called Margins of Reality and I'd love for you to dive in and talk to us a little bit about sensors and filters. What do you mean by that? Okay. Well, Margins of Reality was written in 19... 87, I believe, uh, while the program was, was still relatively new. When it reported our experiments, it reported the findings that we had, uh, some of our speculations on what might be happening, and some background about how this might be relevant to other fields of studies and other areas of experience. In uh, 2007, I think, it was that we published a sequel to that called Consciousness and the Source of Reality, uh, the Pair Odyssey. And that just brought the description of the program up to date with, again, the results and implications thereof. Uh, we wrote another book, um, and this was a very important point. You talk about resonance. Um, a lot of people that were familiar with the program said, you know, your two books that describe the program are fine as far as they go, but people would not really appreciate what Pear was about without knowing about the relationship with you and Bob. And uh, we certainly had a resonant relationship. And, um, you know, he was very much the, uh, the analytical type uh, and I was very much the intuitive type. And we, we brought these things together with um, a lot of respect and um, and uh, affection for each other. Uh, this was very important. We ended up writing another book that we call Molecular Memories, which was just an assortment of small stories about the nature of our relationship and how together we were able to achieve uh, the PEAR program uh, that neither of us could have done alone. Um, now you asked about filters. This was a paper that we wrote where we were talking about uh, sensors, filters, and I forget the rest of it. <laughs> uh, but the, the idea was that our consciousness 
um, organizes its experience via a set of sensors. They may be the senses that we have. It may be our brain, our concepts, but that basically reality uh, is established by applying these filters, by observing the environment and circumstances through a particular uh, frame of reference. And this was how we create our reality. And we, could, we can shift our experience by shifting the nature of those filters that we use or the context. Uh, I, does that make sense to you? It makes sense. And, and um, so I'm, I'm curious, like, how is that done? Like, how do we, how do, how do we actually, um, from an application perspective, shift our filters? Is it, is it about intention? Is it about the visuals that we have or the thoughts that we have? Like, how does that work? Well, it seems to be a combination of intention and attention. Um, when we are observing something with a particular question in mind, um, and we then will tend to focus on certain aspects of it um, that we might miss otherwise. Uh, for example, in physics, uh, physicists talk about the, um, the double slit experiment where they were able to demonstrate that a microscopic uh, particle, like a, a photon or an electron or uh, whatever, would sometimes behave like a wave and sometimes it would behave like a particle. And it wasn't then an either or question, it was a both and question. And it depended on how you set up your experiment, what it was you were looking for. So if you were looking for a wave effect, you would be observing frequencies and amplitudes, for example. If you were looking for a particle effect, you would be looking at position and momentum. And what you were looking for frequently determined what it was you found. Um, and this is, this is something that's well known in physics. And most of the patriarchs of modern physics uh, recognize that this uh, process of consciousness uh, was an important part of what uh, constituted the physical world. Um, and of course, um, we we got into that in a big way. We, we wrote some papers on that about how, on the one hand, we have the physical world, and on the other hand, we have the subjective world. And that it's in the interface between the objective and the subjective domains that our experience becomes um, uh, describable, if you will. Um, wow. Brenda, and so how much of our reality is based on the filter? Is it like, is there a percentage? Like, or is it, are you saying that our entire reality is based on the, the sensors and filters, right? Between the objective and the subjective. I think that's where I'm curious. And I'd, I'd also love to just walk through an example, because I think that this reminds me a little bit of uh, the work of um, Robert Fritz, the the path of least resistance, which is like looking for looking for more of a creative construct rather than falling back into habit. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm just curious, like, what is is there is there a percentage to that um, from from the research that you found, or like how much of our reality are we really creating? Well, I can't answer that, but. I can only say that in our laboratory studies, the effects that we saw tended to be very small, but they would compound over repetition. I don't think we change our reality totally. I think we can somehow maybe tilt the probabilities of the random aspects of our world, those things that are uncertain. Uh, I think when there is a random process or a dimension of uncertainty, that's when this uh, interaction of intention and attention might have an effect. Incidentally, there was one thing, I, a very important thing that I neglected to mention earlier, and that was in both the human machine experiments and the remote perception experiments, we found that there was no effect of either distance or time. Uh, the results we saw could be just as strong over thousands of miles away or over several days before or after the machine uh, or the process was generated. 
So that was also very important. It was clear that space and time were not affecting these studies as much as people would think. People would think, well, you know, you get further away, the effect gets weaker. It really didn't. Um, so, I mean, there we, you know, we run into the possibility that distance and time may not be properties of the physical world as we're used to thinking, but might be properties of consciousness, properties of the way we organize our experience and create meaning. And it is that meaning that we create that determines the reality that we experience. Uh, so it's not so much a physical changing of things as it is just changing the odds on a probabilistic process. And of course, we are inundated with probabilistic issues every day. We may not pay attention to them, uh, but they, they are there. And, and uh, especially in these group experiments, um, we were able to demonstrate that when there was a large group of people that somehow were sharing an experience, it was affecting the probability of a physical device. And I think that has important implications for the world we're living in, which seems to be very chaotic in many ways. But there are groups of people all over, you know, in many different countries and areas that are coming together to explore consciousness and to explore the, uh, the effects of resonance on the, the world around them. And they seem to be getting results also, reducing crime, enhancing the, um, uh, the, the physical environment, the, um, the health of the planet. These are things I think, you know, of all of the things that we have uh, that we have learned, that may be the most important. Except, I guess the other important, and this is a personal finding, uh, is that if space and time are not relevant processes of experience, but but consciousness is. Um, now I don't know if I'm explaining this very clearly, but. No, it's great. I'm I'm following. Yeah, I'm. For me, I have found that uh, I have no fear of dying, because I don't believe our consciousness is localized in the brain or even necessarily in the physical body. I see consciousness with a big C as an organizing principle of the universe. And this is how reality is created on every level you can imagine, whether you're talking about uh, DNA or you're talking about uh, uh, galaxies. Somehow or other, there is an ordering principle that is working with the randomness of the background, the source, if you will, and organizing those parts of it through our intentions and our desires and our our wishes, if you will, to somehow make the, the events uh, alter in subtle ways. And this isn't just the consciousness of humans. We're talking about any living thing uh, has consciousness. In fact, we wrote another book called Being in Biology, where we asked the question, is consciousness another word for the life force itself? And I suspect it is. And if you accept that premise, then your consciousness doesn't disappear. Your essence is not localized in your physical body. Now, I've gone off on another tangent. <laughs> I love, yeah, I love that topic. And, you know, I actually agree with you 100% on that. I don't think our consciousness dies when we die. I have had enough <laughs> experiences in my life to to feel or intuitively know that um, and have had a number of, you know, precognition, premonitions, non-local consciousness um, events happen in my own life to know that it's it's just... Yeah, it's it's an incredible experience when it happens, and and of course I spent two years at the Academy of Intuition Medicine uh, in Marin and spent a lot of time cultivating my intuition, which is, a, is something I think a lot of people don't really learn about or know about, and I think that's also probably why people don't experiment with it or or really cultivate it. 
um, like they do other in- types of intelligences. Well, it's, so, hard to, it's hard to measure. It's inconsistent with our current scientific de- definition of reality, which says it's all material. Uh, right. And, you know, you're, you're challenging some fairly well-established uh, concepts, particularly within the scientific world. Um, and scientists tend to be very skeptical. But like you, I've had a lot of experiences in and out of the laboratory. And I've really come to trust that intuition, to trust that sense of uh, that part of my consciousness that seems to be wiser than my brain is, (laughs) if that makes sense. It's almost as if the brain works almost like a radio or a TV, you know, Uh, You've got all of these frequencies and amplitudes filling up space all over the place, but you don't, you don't know what's going on until you have some kind of a transducer or transformer, like a radio that can pick out, you can tune, we're back to sensors and filters, you can tune to a particular frequency, and then those frequencies come through and you have, voila, the uh, reality of a particular station or program. Um, I think that's what our brains do. They organize, they structure, they put together, they search for patterns. But the the actual intelligence, and it's intelligence with a capital I, comes from a deeper place. And when we learn how to trust that, coincidences seem to happen all the time. There is a uh, theory that one of, uh, uh, I'm going to jump ahead for a bit. When we closed the Pear Lab in 2007, we organized a small nonprofit uh, organization that we called International Consciousness Research Laboratories, or ICRL. And it was basically a small group of colleagues from different fields and backgrounds and uh, areas of expertise, but who all had an interest in the nature of consciousness. And we would get together Uh, periodically to share uh, what we were doing. Um, One of the things we did was we started a a book publishing imprint that we call the ICRL Press. And ICRL Press has now published some 17 books. There are two more in the works right now. But one of those books was written by a couple in Italy Uh, Ulisse Di Corpo and Antonella Benini. And the book is called Syntropy, The Spirit of Love. And the thesis that they are describing is that there is a principle that is complementary, not opposite, but complementary to that of entropy, where entropy is when things become more and more chaotic and the, the, the uh, field sort of comes from the past into the future. And as time goes on, things become more chaotic. Now, we do know that life doesn't follow that, but we'll, we'll let that go for the moment. But they were saying that there is another principle called syntropy. And syntropy comes from the future and moves backward into the past. And it is a principle that draws together, that integrates. And somehow or other, when there is an intention or a vision uh, or an experience in the future that is important and that people are invested in, it will create synchronicities. It will create events that will help bring that vision into being. Um, In any event, I love that idea because it it makes so much sense that we're no longer dealing with either or. We're dealing with both and. Mm, Yes. Paradox. Yeah. Yeah. So I got off track again. Help me. (laughs) (laughs) No, no. It's uh, it's so funny because like you're, you already uh, answered <laughs> two questions that I was going to ask. So I'm just, I'm laughing because I, you know, it's just kind of funny. Like I was, I was going to ask you about the International Consciousness Research Lab, which you already did. And then one of the points that you made earlier, I was going to ask about how not like does non-local consciousness actually work in the past since we're not talking about, you know, time. Um, and so, yeah, you, you've, You've answered both, okay. <laughs> more or less. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah so- time and space as uh, two of the filters—they're very important ones. 
I, I think it may have been Albert Einstein who once pointed out that time and space are uh, very useful because they keep everything from happening all at once. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I haven't heard that one. Uh, Brenda, I'm curious, uh, you know, we're kind of running out of time, but I want to hear a couple more. I have a couple more questions that I wanted, wanted to hear from you on. Uh, first, how your POV has shifted and evolved over time uh, because you've been doing this work for so long, right? You were at PEER for 28 years. You've continued on with the um, the consciousness lab. I'm going to forget the name already. ICR. uh, ICRL. And so, yeah, so I'm just curious if your point of view um, in this work has shifted and also how the pandemic may have shifted your thinking. Well, you know, Uh, I don't know how much it has shifted because from the time I was a little kid, I always had a very vivid imagination. (laughs) I loved reading fairy tales and myths and, uh, you know, looking for what, what Carl Jung called archetypes, these patterns in the universe that seem to be working together, uh, even though people tend to think of them as separate. And, um, I I think up until the time I met Bob John, uh, this was just sort of a private part of myself. But when we we came together uh, to build the laboratory, uh, the uh, the program rather, uh, I became more and more confident that this reality, that my reality, my way of seeing the world was not wrong. It was just another set of filters, if you will. Uh, the the subjective filters rather than the objective measurable ones. So I can't say that my POV has changed that much. It's just become stronger and uh, more confident as time goes by. And as I say, the most important thing is I have come to accept the fact that death is not the end of things. It's just a transition. And, uh, I think, you know, the fear of dying is something that uh, really uh, motivates an awful lot of people in the way they live. Uh, So I have just come to accept these intuitive insights and to trust them because more often than not, they turn out to be right, even if they don't seem to be uh, rational at first. So that's a strange answer. No, it's powerful. It's that's powerful, and and I think the interaction with Bob, uh, I learned more about the analytical world, and I think he learned more about the intuitive world. So we uh, we both grew together in that mm. sense. Love that. I love the the resonant partnership. <laughs> it's great. Uh, so Brenda, I wanted to ask you what has surprised you the most about being on this journey. If you look back on your career, what do you think has surprised you the most? You know, um, as the years went by, we found we were uh, attracting interest from many people from all over. People who were looking for validation for unusual experiences that they had. You know, well, hey, these scientists from Princeton say it's okay, so it must be okay. Um, but we have built a very large community, and it is this community that is somehow or other the most, I can't even say surprising, but the most um, treasured part of what we accomplished at the Pear Laboratory. Uh, more and more people are being drawn to the study of consciousness, to the study of intuition, to the recognition that there is a spiritual dimension uh, to our being as well as a physical one. And as I watch this community growing, um, I I have much faith in the fact that, well, I don't know if I'm gonna say fact, but in the possibility that this collective intention, this collective love, uh, this unified consciousness can change the outcome of the uh, the situations that we are in today. Now, I don't know if I could say that's surprising, but it certainly is gratifying. Mm. 
Thank you. Yeah, I I certainly hope so. I think I think if people knew how powerful they really are and how much they can shift, right? It's like even if it is small changes um, that we can affect the probability of small changes, like you said, it compounds over time. I think if people knew how powerful they are, they would probably start changing their <laughs> thoughts, intentions and resonance to create the world. I really think that's happening, Yasmin. I think that this pandemic that we've been suffering through in the last year or two has uh, prompted a lot of people to take stock of who they are, of what's meaningful, of what's really important in their lives, um, uh, and really shift their point of view to come to accept the fact that uh, their, their being, their spiritual being is an important component of who they are. Uh, and th I really believe that's growing. And, um, you know, it's sort of like there's a yin and yang dance going on. There is consciousness, this ordering principle, okay, uh, which would be the yang. And then there's this background noise or chaos, which is the yin but they are interacting, they're dancing together. And, um, you know, the Tao Te Ching uh, is, is known as the book of changes. And I think this yin yang dance uh, can bring about changes in the physical and in the spiritual world. And so, you know, when we're part of that dance, um, uh, we are in some small way helping to bring more order into, into the chaos of the uh, environment. Mm. Wow. Beautifully said, Brenda. That's so moving and so touching. <laughs> One other thing, yes, I mean, I'd like to add, and this was one of these synchronicities that it has been, you talk about surprising. Um, when we close the lab, we put all of our experimental gear and the furniture and the books and the papers and whatnot into storage and as the years have gone on, I have been finding myself thinking, you know, what's going to happen to all of this? Is it just going to end up getting trashed? And well, last year, um, I came into correspondence with a man named Peter Merry, who's affiliated with the Ubiquity University in the UK. I had had correspondence with Peter many years before, but we'd gotten out of touch but we came back together. He asked if he could interview me, which we did. And one thing led to another. And he has arranged for the pair laboratory to be re, uh, reincarnated, if you will, at this wonderful place in the UK called the Broughton Hall Estate, which is a, um, a very large estate that has... Um, is t totally devoted to the to a green vision, both in you know the, the physical environment and its spiritual goals. And we have been moving the pair equipment and facilities to Broughton little by little. And this November, there's going to be a uh, an initiation or inauguration of the new pair lab at the Broughton Hall Estate. Uh, Peter calls it the weird W-Y-R-D experience, <laughs> um, uh, mind and matter coming together, science and spirituality coming together. And so uh, the pair lab is going to continue uh, in its own, along its own path. And, you know, this is perhaps sim uh, uh, something to do with the syntropy process that it had an, it, there was an intention, a vision early on that Bob and I shared and worked toward and that other people did, that what we did at PEAR would have some kind of immeasurable, tangible effect. And it would not just die out, but it would grow and it would create a community of people who shared that vision. And that seems to be happening. And uh, it does kind of blow my mind. That's amazing. So incredible. Congrats. <laughs> wow. Um, Brenda, thank you so much for your time. This was just so enlightening. Um, are there any resources that you can point folks to in order to learn more about you and the work and, um, and just maybe some of the books that you uh, 
think people can get started with if they're new to you for the first time, for example? Well, I would suggest that people go to the ICRL website, which is icrl.org. And in there, you can find some descriptions of the program. There is a link to the pair uh, website that describes everything we we did. There are publications that describe various aspects of the research that can be downloaded. We also hold monthly meetups where we have uh, special guest speakers that come and we've been doing this on Zoom this past year or so, obviously. But it's been attracting a very a wonderful audience of people who are interested and, you know, it's dealing with many different topics that um, uh, that are related in one way or another to, to consciousness, to the science spirituality connection or complementarity, I might say. And all of the books that we've published are there under the ICRL press. So, you know, the meetups are all recorded and they're there under the, the, the tab called events. So that would probably be the first place to look for more information. Wonderful. Yeah. And we'll leave all the links in the show notes so that people can find the organization and find more about the work that you guys are are doing. So thank you so much for your time, Brenda. Uh, I have so many more questions to ask you. I'm I'm just so intrigued by all the knowledge that you've accumulated all these years. Um, so thanks again for being on the show. Well, thank you for inviting me, Yasmin. And thank you for the work that you're doing, because that's part of this vision that is growing. Um, it's so important. So I, I really admire and respect what you're doing and feel very privileged to be a part of it today. Oh, thank you so much, Brenda. Thank you. Thank you. Well, for our audience, thanks for joining and for listening. In this episode, we learned about the quirks of the quantum mind with Brenda Dunn from the Princeton Engineering Lab here, and you can tune in to Gateways to Awakening, where we host one-on-one conversations with leading experts in wellness and spirituality. Thanks again.